on the bonfire and pouring on oil and pitch till the flames rose high. Stephen saw what was necessary and stood out of the way, but close to the old whaler, where the light fell on both their faces as they looked in the direction of the swimmer. Stephen's red dress itself stood out like a flame. The gale, tearing up the front of the cliff, had whirled away her hat. In the stress of the wind her hair was torn from its up-pinning and flew wide, itself like a leaping flame. Her gestures as she swept her right arm round, as though demonstrating the outward curve of a circle, or raising the hand above her head, motioned with wide palm and spread fingers, back, back, seemed to have reached the swimmer's intelligence. He half rose in the water and looked about, as if seeing something that he realised. He sank back again and began to swim frantically out to sea. A great throb of joy made Stephen almost faint. At last, she had been able to do something to help the gallant man. In half a minute, his efforts seemed to tell in his race for life. He drew sufficiently far from the dangerous current for there to be a hope that he might be saved if he could last out the stress to come. The fishermen kept watch in silent eagerness, and in their presence Stephen felt a comfort, though, like her, they could do nothing at present. When the swimmer had passed sufficiently far out to be clear of the rocks, the fire began to lose its flame, though not its intensity. It would be fiery still for hours to come, and of great heat, but the flames ceased to leap, and in the moderated light Stephen only saw the white face for one more instant, ere it faded out of her ken. When turning, the man looked towards the light and made a gesture which she did not understand, for he put for an instant both hands before his face. Just then there was a wild noise on the cliff. The rocket cart, drawn by sixteen splendid horses, some of them hunters, came tearing up the slope, and with it many men on horseback afoot. Many of the runners were the gentlemen who had given their horses for the good work. As the Coast Guards jumped from the cart and began to get out the rocket stand, the old whaler pointed out to the direction where the swimmer's head could still be seen. Some of the sailors could see it too, though to Stephen and the layman it was invisible. The chief boatman shook his head. No use throwing a line there. Even if he got it, we could never drag him alive through these rocks. He would be pounded to death before twenty thaven. Stephen's heart grew cold as she listened. Was it the end? Then, with a bitter cry, she wailed. Oh, can nothing be done? Can nothing be done? Can no boat come from the other side of the point? Must such a brave man be lost? And her tears began to flow. One of the young men who had just arrived, a neighbouring squire, a proved wastrel, but a fine horseman who had already regarded Stephen at the few occasions of their meeting with eyes of manifest admiration, spoke up. Don't cry, Lady de Lanoir. There's a chance for him yet. I'll see what I can do. Bless you, oh bless you, she cried impulsively as she caught his hand. Then came the chill of doubt. But what can you do? she added despairingly. Hector and I may be able to do something together. Turning to one of the fishermen, he asked, Is there any way down to the water, in the shelter of the point? Aye, aye, sir, 
came the ready answer. There's the path as we get down by to our boats. Come on, men, he said. Some of you chaps, show us a light on the way down. If Hector can manage the scramble, there's a chance. You see, he said, turning again to Stephen. Hector can swim like a fish. When he was a racer, I trained him in the sea so that none of the touts could spy out his form. Many's the swim we've had together, and in rough water too, though in none so wild as this. But it is a desperate chance for you, said Stephen, women like drawing somewhat back from a danger she had herself evoked. The young man laughed lightly. What of that? I say... I may do one good thing before I die. That fine fellow's life is worth a hundred of my wasted one. Here, some of you fellows, help me with Hector. We must take him from the cart and get a girth on him instead of the saddle. We shall want something to hold on to without pulling his head down by using the bridle. He, followed by some others, ran to the rocket cart where the horses stood panting their steam rising in a white cloud in the glow of the burning house. In an incredibly short time, the horse was ready, with only the girth. The young squire took him by the mane, and he followed eagerly. He had memories of his own. As they passed close to Stephen, the squire said to one of his friends, "'Hold him a minute, Jack!' he ran over to Stephen and looked at her hand. Goodbye, wish me luck, and give us light. Tears were in her eyes, and a flush on her cheek, as she took his hand and clasped it hard. Oh, you brave man, God bless you. He stooped suddenly and impulsively, kissed the back of her hand lightly, and was gone. For a fleeting moment, she was angry, no man had kissed her hand before, but the thought of his liberty was swept away by another, little enough when he may be going to his death. It was a sight to see that man and horse, surrounded by an eager crowd of helpers, scrambling down the rough zigzag, cut and worn in the very face of the cliff. They stumbled and slipped, pebbles and broken rock fell away under their feet. Alone, close to the bonfire, stood Stephen, following every movement with racing blood and beating heart. The bonfire was glowing. A constant stream of men and women were dragging and hauling all sorts of material for its increase. The head of the swimmer could be seen, rising and falling amid the waves beyond the Skyrus. When about twenty feet from the water level, the path jutted out to one side left of the little beach, whereon the sea now broke fiercely. This was a place where men watching, and whence at times they fished the rods, the broad rock overhung the water, the fire above, though it threw shadows, made light enough for everything. The squire held up his hand. Stop! We can take off his rock, if the water is deep enough. How much is it? Ten fathoms sheer. Good. He mentioned to them all to keep back, then threw off all his clothes except shirt and trousers. For an instant he patted Hector and then sprang upon his back. Holding him by the mane, he urged him forward with a cry. The noble animal did not hesitate an instant. He knew that grasp of the mane, that cry, that dig of the spurless heels. He sprang forward with wide, dilated nostrils, and from the edge of the jutting rock jumped far out into the sea. Man and horse disappeared for a few seconds, but rose safely. The man slid from the horse's back, and, holding by the girth with one hand, 
swam beside him out to sea, in the direction the swimmer must come on, rounding the sunken rocks. A wild cheer broke from all on the cliff above, and those already scrambling back up the zigzag. Stephen kept encouraging the men to bring fuel to the bonfire. Bring everything you can. Find the carts, the palings, the roofs, the corn, the dried fish, anything and everything that will burn. We must have light, plenty of light. Two brave men's lives are at stake now. The whole place was a scene of activity. Stephen stood on the edge of the cliff with the old whaler and the chief boatman, and some of the women. The rest of the coast guards were, by orders of their chief, rigging up a whip which they thought might be necessary to hoist the men up from the water, if they could ever get close enough. One of the young men, who had ridden with the rocket cart, kept tight hold of Hector's bridle. He knew it would be wanted if the horse ever had a chance of landing. When Harold turned away from the dazzling blue lights on the pier and saw the far white line of the cliffs beyond the bay, his heart sank within him. Even his great strength and hardihood, won by work and privation in the far northwest, had been already taxed in the many days of the battling with the gale, when all on board who could lend a hand were taken into service, again by the frantic struggle of the last hour or two, when the ship ran shoreward at the utmost of her speed, in the last hope of breaching in time to save life. Finally, in that grim struggle to draw the lifeline shoreward, the cold and then the great heat, and on top of it the chill of the long swim seemed to have struck at him, alone on the dark sea, for soon the current and his own exertions were taking him away from the rocks. The light of the burning ship was ceasing to be effective. It was just enough to hinder his vision. Looking from the patch of light which bathed the light and him, he could just see far off the white water which marked the cliff fronts, and on the edge of his horizon, the grim moving white wall where the waves broke on the headland. On and on he toiled. His limbs were becoming more cramped with the cold and the terrible strain of swimming in such waves. But still the brave heart bore him up, and resolutely, sternly, he faced himself afresh to the effort before him. He reasoned that where there was such a headland standing out so stark into the sea, there ought to be some shelter in its lee. If he could pass it, he might find calmer water and even a landing place beyond. Here at last was hope. He would try to round the point at any rate. Now he drew so close that the great rocks seemed to tower vast above him. He was not yet close enough to feel as though lapped in their shadow, but even the overcast sky seemed full of light above the line of the cliff. There was a strange roaring, rushing sound around him. He thought that it was not merely the waves dashing on the rocks, but that partly it came from his own ears, that his ebbing strength was feeling the frantic struggle which he was making. The end was coming, he thought, but still he kept valiantly on, set and silent, as is the way with brave men. Suddenly, from the top of the cliff, a bright light flashed. He looked at it sideways as he fought his way on, and saw the light rise and fall and flicker as the flames leaped. High over him he saw fantastic figures which seemed to dance on the edge of the high cliff. They had evidently noticed him and were making signals of some sort 
but what the motions were he could not see or understand, for they were but dark silhouettes edged with light against the background of the fire. The only thing he could think was that they meant to encourage him, and so he urged himself to further effort. It might be that help was at hand. Several times, as he turned his head sideways, he saw the figures and the light, but not so clearly. It was as though the light was lessening in power. When again he looked, he saw a new fire leap out of the edge of the cliff, and some figures to the right of it. They were signalling in some way. So pausing in his swimming, he rose a little from the water and looked at them. A thrill shot through him, and a paralysing thought that he must have gone mad. With his wet hand, he cleared his eyes, though the touching them pained him terribly, and for an instant saw clearly. There on the edge of the cliff, standing beside some men and waving her arms in a wild sweep, as though motioning frantically, keep out, keep out, was a woman. Instinctively he glanced to his left and saw a white waste of leaping water, through which sharp rocks rose like monstrous teeth. On the instant he saw the danger, and made out seaward, swimming frantically, to clear the dangerous spot before the current would sweep him upon the rocks. But the woman, as one remembers the last sight when the lightning has banished sight, so that vision seemed burned into his brain, a woman with a scarlet riding habit and masses of long red hair blowing in the gale like leaping flame. Could there be two such persons in the world? No, no, it was a vision, a vision of the woman he loved, come to save him in the direst moment of great peril. His heart beat with new hope. Only the blackness of the stormy sea was before him as he strove frantically on. Presently, when he felt the current slacken, for he had been swimming across it and could feel its power, he turned and looked back. As he did so, he murmured aloud, A dream, a vision. She came to warn me, for as he looked, all had disappeared, cliff and coastline, dark rocks and leaping seas, blazing fire, and the warning vision of the woman he loved. Again, he looked where the waste of the sea, churning amongst the sunken rocks had been. He could hear the roaring of waters, the thunder of great waves beating on the iron-bound coast, but nothing could he see. He was alone on the wild sea, in the dark. Then, truly, the swift shadow of despair fell upon him. Blind, blind, he moaned, and, for the moment, stricken with despair, sank into the trough of the waves. But the instinctive desire for life recalled him. Once more he fought his way up to the surface and swam blindly, desperately on. Seeing nothing, he did not know which way he was going. He might have heard better had his eyes been able to help his ears. But in the sudden strange darkness, all the senses were astray. In the agony of his mind, he could not even feel the pain of his burnt face. The torture of his eyes had passed, but with the instinct of a strong man, he kept on swimming blindly, desperately. It seemed as if ages of untold agony had gone by when he heard a voice seemingly beside him. Lay hold there! Catch the girth! The voice came muffled by the wind and wave. His strength was now nearly at its last. The shock of his blindness and the agony of the moments that had passed had finished his exhaustion. But a little longer, 
and he must have sunk into his rest. But the voice and the help it promised rallied him for a moment. He had hardly strength to speak, but he managed to gasp out, "Where, where, where? Help me! I'm blind." A hand took his and guided it to a tightened girth. Instinctively, his fingers closed round it, and he hung on grimly. His senses were going fast. He felt as if it was all a strange dream. A voice here in the sea, a girth, a horse. He could hear it. Hard breathing. The voice came again. Steady, hold on. My God, he's fainted. I must tie him on. He heard a tearing sound, and something was wound around his wrists. Then his nerveless fingers relaxed their hold, and all passed into oblivion. Chapter Thirty-Three, The Queen's Room. To Stephen, all that now happened seemed like a dream. She saw Hector and his gallant young master forge across the smoother water of the current, whose boisterous stream had been somewhat stilled in the churning amongst the rocks, and then go north in the direction of the swimmer, who, strange to say, was drifting in again towards the sunken rocks. Then. She saw the swimmer's head sink under the water, and her heart grew cold. Was this to be the end? Was such a brave man to be lost after such a gallant effort as he had made? And just at that moment, when help was at hand, the few seconds seemed ages. Instinctively, she shut her eyes and prayed again. Oh God! Give me the man's life that I may atone. God seems to have heard her prayer. Nay, more, he had mercifully allowed her to be the means of averting great danger. She would never, could never forget the look on the man's face when he saw, by the flame that she had kindled ahead of him, the danger from the sunken rocks. She had. Exulted at the thought, and now she was recalled by a wild cheer beside her. Opening her eyes, she saw that the man's head had risen again from the water. He was swimming furiously this time seaward, but close at hand were the heads of the swimming horse and man. She saw the young squire seize the man, and then. The rush of her tears blinded her. When she could see again, the horse had turned and was making back again to the shelter of the point. The squire had his arm stretched across the horse's back. He was holding up the sailor's head, which seemed to roll helplessly with every motion of the cumbering sea. For a little, she thought he was dead. But the voice of the cold water reassured her. He was just in time. The poor chap was done, and so, with beating heart and eyes that did not flinch, now she watched the slow progress to the shelter of the point. The coast guards and fishermen had made up their minds where the landing could be made, and were ready. On the rocky shelf. Whence Hector had at jumped, they stood by with lines. When the squire had steered and encouraged the horse, whose snorting could be heard from the sheltered water till he was just below the rocks, they lowered a noosed rope. This he fastened around the senseless man below his shoulders. One strong, careful pull, and he was safe. On land, and soon was being borne up the steep zigzag on the shoulders of the willing crowd. In the meantime, other ropes were passed down to the squire. 
one he placed round his own waist, two others he fastened, one on each side of the horse's girth. Then his friend lowered the bridle, and he managed to put it on the horse and attached a rope to it. The fishermen took the lines, and paying out as they went, so as to leave plenty of slack line, got on the rocks, just above the little beach, whereon sheltered, though it was, the seas broke heavily. There they waited ready to put the horse through the surf, when he should have come close enough. Stephen did not see the rescue of the horse, for just then a tall, grave man spoke to her. Pardon me, Lady de Lanois, but is the man to be brought up to the castle? I'm told you have given orders that all the rescued shall be taken there. She answered unhesitatingly, Certainly, I gave orders before coming out that preparation was to be made for them. I am Mr. Hilton. I have just come down to do locum tenens for Dr. Winter at Lanark Port. I rode over on hearing there was a wreck and came here with a rocket cart. I shall take charge of the man and bring him up. He will doubtless want some special care. If you would be so good, she answered, feeling a difference which was new to her. At that moment, the crowd carrying the senseless man began to appear over the cliff, coming up the zigzag. The doctor hurried towards him. She followed at a little distance, fearing lest she should hamper him. Under his orders, they laid the patient on the weather side of the bonfire, so that the smoke would not reach him. The doctor knelt by his side. An instant after, he looked up and said, He is alive. His heart is beating. Though faintly, he had better be taken away at once. There is no means here of shelter. Bring him in the rocket cart. It is the only conveyance here, cried Stephen. And bring Mr. Hepburn too. He also will need some care after his gallant service. I shall ride on and advise my household of your coming, and you good people, come all to the castle. You are to be my guests, if you will so honour me. No, no, really, I should prefer to ride alone. She said this impulsively, seeing that several of the gentlemen were running for their horses to accompany her. I shall not wait to thank that valiant young gentleman. I shall see him at Lenoir. As she was speaking, she had taken the bridle of her horse. One of the young men stooped and held his hand. She bowed, put her foot in it, and sprang to the saddle. In an instant, she was flying across country at full speed in the dark. A wild mood was on her, reaction from the prolonged agony of apprehension. There was little which she would not have done just then. The gale whistled round her, and now and again she shouted with pure joy. It seemed as if God himself had answered her prayers and given her the returning life. By the time she had reached the castle, the wild ride had done its soothing work. She was calm again. Comparatively, her wits and feelings were her own. There was plenty to keep her occupied, mind and body. The train of persons saved from the wreck were arriving in all sorts of vehicles, and as clothes had been found for them, as well as food and shelter, there was no end to the exertions necessary. She felt as though the world were not wide enough for the welcome she wished to extend. Its exercise was a sort of reward of her exertions, 
a thank offering for the response to her prayer. She moved amongst her guests, forgetful of herself, of her strange attire, of the state of dishevelment and grime in which she was. The result of the storm, her long ride over rough ground with its share of marshes and pools, and the smoke from the bonfire, and the blazing house. The strangers wondered at first, till they come to understand, that she was the Lady Bountiful, who had stretched her helpful hands to them. Those who could made themselves useful with their new batches of arrivals. The whole castle was lit from cellar to tower. The kitchens were making lordly provisions. The servants were carrying piles of clothes of all sorts and helping to fit those who came still wet from the passage through or over the heavy sea. In the general disposition of chambers, Stephen ordered to be set apart from the rescued swimmer, the royal chamber where Queen Elizabeth had lain, and for Mr Hepburn, that which had been occupied by the second George. She had a sort of idea that the stranger was God's guest, who was coming to her house, and that nothing could be too good for him. As she waited for his coming, even though she swept to and fro in her ministrations to others, she felt as though she trod on air. Some great weight seemed to have been removed from her. Her soul was free again. At last, the rocket cart arrived, and with it many horsemen and such men and women as could run across country with equal speed to the horses labouring by the longer road. The rescued man was still senseless, but that alone did not seem to cause anxiety to the doctor, who hurried him at once into the prepared room. When assisted by some of the other men, he had undressed him, rubbed him down and put him to bed, and had seen some of the others who had been rescued from the wreck. He sought out Lady de Lenoir. He told her that his anxiety was for the man's sight, an announcement which blanched his hearer's cheeks. She had so made up her mind as to his perfect safety that the knowledge of any kind of ill came like a cruel shock. She questioned Mr. Hilton closely, so closely that he thought it well to tell her at once all that he surmised and feared. That fine young fellow who swam out with his horse to him tells me that when he heard him he cried out that he was blind. I have made some inquiries from those on the ship, and they tell me that he was a passenger named Robinson. Not only was he not blind then, but he was the strongest and most alert man on the ship. If it be blindness, it must have come on during that long swim. It may be that before leaving the ship, he received some special injury. Indeed, he has several cuts and burns and bruises, and that the irritation of the seawater increased it. I can do nothing till he wakes. At present he is in such a state that nothing can be done for him. Later I shall, if necessary, give him a hypodermic to ensure sleep. In the morning, when I come again, I shall examine him fully. But you're not going away tonight, said Stephen in dismay. Can't you manage to stay here? Indeed you must. Look at all these people, some of whom may need special attention or perhaps treatment. We do not know yet if any may be injured, he answered at once. Of course I shall stay if you wish it, but there are two other doctors here already. 
I must go over to my own place to get some necessary instruments for the examination of this special patient, but that I can do in the early morning. Can I not send for what you want? The whole household are at your service. All that can be done for that gallant man must be done. You can send to London for special help, if you wish. If that man is blind, or in danger of blindness, we must have the best oculist in the world for him. All shall be done that is possible, she said earnestly. But till I examine him in the morning we can do nothing. I am myself an oculist. That is my department in St. Stephen's Hospital. I have an idea of what is wrong, but I cannot diagnose exactly until I can use the ophthalmoscope. His words gave Stephen confidence, laying her hand on his arm unconsciously in the extremity of pity, she said earnestly, Oh, do what you can for him. He must be a noble creature, and all that is possible must be done. I shall never rest happily if, through any failing on my part, he suffers as you fear. I shall do all I can, he said, with equal earnestness, touched with her eager pity. And I shall not trust myself alone, if any other can be of service. Depend on it, Lady Delanois, all shall be as you wish. There was little sleep in the castle that night till late. Mr. Hilton slept on a sofa in the Queen's room, after he had administered a narcotic to his patient. As soon as the eastern sky began to quicken, he rode, as he had arranged during the evening, to Dr. Winter's house at Lanark Port, where he was staying. After selecting such instruments and drugs as he required, he came back in the dog-cart. It was still early morning when he regained the castle. He found Lady Delanois up and looking anxiously for him. Her concern was somewhat abated when he was able to tell her that his patient still slept. It was a painful scene for Mr. Hilton when his patient woke. Fortunately, some of the after-effects of the narcotic remained, for his despair at realising that he was blind was terrible. It was not that he was violent. To be so under his present circumstances would have been foreign to Harold's nature, but there was a despair which was infinitely more sad to witness than passion. He simply moaned to himself, blind, blind, and again, in every phase of horrified amazement, as though he could not realise the truth, blind, blind. The doctor laid his hand on his breast and said very gently, my poor fellow, it is a dreadful thing to face, uh, to think of, but as yet I have not been able to come to any conclusion, unable even to examine you. I do not wish to encourage hopes that may be false, but there are cases when injury is not vital and perhaps only temporary. In such case, your best chance, indeed your only chance, is to keep quiet. You must not even think, if possible, of anything that may excite you. I am now about to examine you with the ophthalmoscope. You are a man. None of us who saw your splendid feet last night can doubt your pluck. Now I want you to use some of it to help us both. You, for your recovery, if such is possible, me to help me in my work. I have asked some of your late companions who tell me that on shipboard you were not only well and of good sight, but that you were remarkable 
even amongst strong men. Whatever it is you suffer from must have come on quickly. Tell me all you can remember of it. The doctor listened attentively whilst Harold told all he could remember of his sufferings when he spoke of the return of old rheumatic pains his hearer said involuntarily good harold paused but went on at once the doctor recognized that he had rightly appraised his remark and by it judged that he was a well-educated man something in the method of speaking struck him and he said as nonchalantly as he could by the way which was your university cambridge trinity he spoke without thinking and the instant he had done so stopped the sense of his blindness rushed back on him he could not see and his ears were not yet trained to take the place of his eyes he must guard himself thenceforward he was so cautious in his replies that mr hilton felt convinced there was some purpose of his reticence he therefore stopped asking questions and began to examine him he was unable to come to much result his opinion was shown in his report to lady delanois i am unable to say anything definite as yet the case is a most interesting one as a case and quite apart from the splendid fellow who is the subject of it i have hopes that within a few days i may be able to know more i need not trouble you with surgical terms but later on if the diagnosis supports the supposition at present in my mind i shall be able to speak more fully in the meantime i shall with your permission wait here so that i may watch him myself oh you are good thank you thank you said stephen she had so taken the man under her own care that she was grateful for any kindness shown to him not at all said mr hilton any man who behaved as that fellow did has a claim on any of us who may help him no time of mine could be better spent when he went back to the patient's room he entered softly for the thought he might be asleep the room was according to his instructions quite dark and as it was unfamiliar to him he felt his way cautiously Harold, however, heard the small noise he made, and said quietly, Who's there? It is I, Hilton. Are you alone? Yes. Look round the room and see. Then lock the door and come and talk to me. If you will, you will pity a poor blind fellow, I know. The darkness has come down upon me so quickly that I'm not accustomed to it. There was a break in his voice which moved the other. He lit a candle, feeling that the doing so would impress his patient, and went round the room, not with cat-like movement this time. He wanted the other to hear him. When he had turned the key in the lock as sharply as he could, he came to the bedside and sat down. Harold spoke again after a short pause is that candle still lit yes would you like it put out if you don't mind again i say pity me and pardon me but i want to ask you something privately between our two selves and i will feel more of equality than if you were looking at me whilst i cannot see you mr hilton blew out the candle. There. We are equal now. Thank you. A long pause, then he went on. When a man becomes suddenly blind, is there usually, or even occasionally, any sort of odd sight? Does he see anything like a a dream, a vision? 
Not that I know of. I have never heard of such a case. As a rule, people struck blind by lightning, which is the most common case, sometimes remember with extraordinary accuracy the last thing they have seen, just as though it were photographed on the retina. Thank you. Is such usually the reoccurrence of any old dream or anything they have much thought of? No, not that I know of. It would be unusual. Harold waited a long time before he spoke again. When he did so, it was in a different voice, a constrained voice. The doctor, accustomed to take enlightenment from trivial details, noted it. Now tell me, Mr. Hilton, something about what has happened. Where am I? In Lanoir Castle. Where is it? In Angleshire. Who does it belong to? Lady de Lanoir, the Countess of Lanoir. They tell me she is a Countess in her own right. It is very good of her to have me here. Is she an old lady? No, a young one. Young and very beautiful, after a pause, before his query. What's she like? Describe her to me. She is young, a little over twenty, tall and of a very fine figure. She has eyes like black diamonds and her hair like a flame. For a long time Harold remained still. Then he said, Tell me all you know or have learned of this whole affair. How was I rescued and by whom? So the doctor proceeded to give him every detail he knew of when he was quite through. The other again lay still for a long time. The silence was broken by a gentle tap at the door. The doctor lit a candle. He turned the key softly so that no one would notice that the door was locked. Something was said in a low whisper. Then the door was gently closed and the doctor returning said, Lady Lenoir wants, if it will not disturb you, to ask how you are. Ordinarily, I should not let anyone see you, but she is not only your hostess, but as I have just told you, it was her idea, it was her ride to the headland, where she burned the house to give you light, which was the beginning of your rescue. Still, if you think it better not, I hardly like anybody to see me like this, said Harold, feebly seeking an excuse. My dear man, said the other, you may be easy in your mind. She won't see much of you. You are all bandages and beard. She'll have to wait a while before she sees you. Didn't she see me last night? Not she. Whilst we were trying to rescue you, she was rushing back to the castle to see that all was ready for you, and for the others from the wreck. This vaguely soothed Harold. If his surmise was correct, and if she had not seen him, then it was well that he was bandaged now. He felt that it would not do to refuse to let her see him. It might look suspicious. So after pausing a short while, he said in a low voice, I suppose she had better come now. We must not keep her waiting. When the doctor brought her to his bedside, Stephen felt in a measure awed. His bandaged face and head and his great beard singed in patches, looked to her in the dim light rather awesome. In a very gentle voice, she said kind things to the sick man, who acknowledged them in a feeble whisper. The doctor, a keen observer, noticed the change in his voice, and, determined to understand more, Stephen spoke of his bravery and how it was due to him 
that all on the ship were saved, and, as she spoke, her emotion moved her so much that her sweet voice shook and quivered to the ears of the man who had now only sound to guide him. It was music of the sweetest he had ever heard. Fearing lest the voice should betray him, he whispered his own thanks feebly and in few words. When Stephen went away, the doctor went with her. It was more than an hour before he returned. He found his patient in what he considered a state of suppressed excitement, for though his thoughts were manifestly collected and his words were calm, he was restless and excited in other ways. He had evidently been thinking of his own condition, for shortly after the doctor came in, he said, Are we alone? Quite. I want you to arrange that there shall not be any nurse with me. My dear sir, don't handicap me and yourself with such a restriction. It is for your own good that you should have regular and constant attention, but I don't wish it. Not for the present, at all events. I am not accustomed to a nurse, and I shall not feel comfortable in a few days, perhaps. The decided tone of his voice struck the other, keeping his own thoughts and intentions in abeyance. Even to himself, he answered heartily, All right, I shall not have any nurse at present. Thanks. There was relief in the tone, which seemed undue, and Mr. Hilton again took mental note. Presently, he asked a question, but in such a tone that the doctor pricked up his ears. There was a premeditated self-suppression, a gravity of restraint which implied some falsity, some intention other than the words conveyed. It must have been a job to carry me up those stairs. The doctor was doubting everything, but as the safest attitude, he stuck to literal truth as far as his words conveyed it. Yes, you are no light weight, to himself, he mused. How did he know there were stairs? He cannot know it. He was senseless. Therefore, he must be guessing or inquiring, Harold went on. I suppose the castle is on high ground. Can you see far from the windows? I suppose we are up a good height. Uh, from the windows, you can see all round the promontory, uh, but we are not high up, that is. The room is not high from the ground, though the castle is from the sea. Harold asked again, his voice vibrating in the note of gladness. Are we on the ground floor, then? Yes, and I suppose the gardens are below us? Yes. The answer was given quickly, for a thought was floating through him. Why did the strong, brave man, suddenly stricken blind, wish to know whether his windows were at a height? He was not surprised when his patient, reaching out a hand, rested it on his arm and said in an imploring tone, It should be moonlight, a full moon, two nights ago. Won't you pull up the blind and describe to me all you see? Tell me fully. Remember, I am blind. This somehow fixed the doctor's thought. Suicide. But I must convey the inutility of such effort by inference, not falsity. Accordingly, he began to describe the scene from the very base of the wall, where, below the balcony, the great border was glorious with a mass of foliage plants, away to the distant sea, now bathed in the flood of moonlight. Harold asked, question after question, the doctor replying accurately, 
till he felt that the patient was building up a concrete idea of his surroundings near and far. Then he left him. He stood for a long time out in the passage thinking. He said to himself as he moved away, the poor fellow has some grim intention in his mind. I must not let him know that I suspect, but tonight I will watch without his knowing it. Chapter 34 Waiting Mr Hilton telegraphed at once, countermanding, for the present, the nurse from whom he had sent. That night, when the household had all retired, he came quietly to his patient's room, and entering noiselessly, sat silent in a far corner. There was no artificial light. The patient had to be kept in darkness. There was, however, a bright moonlight, sufficient light, stole in through the edges of the blinds to allow him, when his eyes grew accustomed to see what might happen. Harold lay quite still till the house was quiet. He had been thinking ever since he had ascertained the identity of Stephen. In his weakness and the paralysing despair of his blindness, all his former grief and apprehension had come back upon him in a great wave. Veritably, the tide of circumstances seemed to run hard against him. He had had no idea of forcing himself upon Stephen, and yet here he was, a guest in her house, without her knowledge or his own. She had saved his life by her energy and resource. Fortunately, she did not as yet know him. The bandages and his act in suppressing his voice had so far protected him. But such could not last for long. He could not see to protect himself and take precautions as need arose. And he knew well that Stephen's nature would not allow her to be satisfied without doing all that was possible to help one who had under her eyes made a great effort on behalf of others, and to whom there was the added bond that his life was due to her. In but a little time she must find out to whom she ministered. What then would happen? Her kindness was such that when she realised the blindness of her old friend, she might so pity him that out of the depths of her pity she would forgive, she would take back all the past, and now that she knew of his old love for her, would perhaps be willing to marry him. Back flooded the old memory of her independence and her theory of sexual equality. If out of any selfish or mistaken idea, she did not hesitate to ask a man to marry her, would it be likely that when the nobler and more heroic side of her nature spoke, she would hesitate to a similar act in her pursuance of her self-sacrifice? So it might be that she would either find herself once again flouted or else married to a man she did not love. Such a catastrophe should not happen, whatever the cost to him. He would, blind as he was, steal away in the night and take himself out of her life, this time forever. Better the ingratitude of an unknown man, the saving of whose life was due to her, than the long dull routine of a spoiled life, which would otherwise be her unhappy lot. When once the idea had taken root in his mind, he had taken such steps as had been open to him, without endangering the secrecy of his motive. Thanks to his subtle questioning of the doctor, he now knew that his room was close to the ground, so that he would easily drop from the window and steal away without immediate danger of any restraining accident. 
If he could once get away, he would be all right. There was a large sum to his credit in each of two London banks. He would manage somehow to find his way to London, even if he had to walk and beg his way. He felt that now, in the silence of the night, the time had come. Quietly, he rose and felt his way to the door, now and again stumbling and knocking against unknown obstacles in the manner of the recently blind. After each such noise, he paused and listened. He felt as if the very walls had ears. When he reached the door, he turned the key softly. Then he breathed more freely. He felt that he was, at last, alone and free to move without suspicion. Then began a great and arduous search, one that was infinitely difficult and exasperating, and full of pathos to the sympathetic man who watched him in silence. Mr. Hilton could not understand his movements as he felt his way about the room, opening drawers and armoires now and again, stooping down and feeling along the floor. He did not betray his presence, however, but moved noiselessly away as the other approached. It was a hideously real game of blind man's bluff, with perhaps a life as the forfeit. Harold went all over the room, and at last sat down on the edge of the bed, with a hollow, suppressed groan that was full of pain. He had found his clothes, but realised that they were now but rags. He put on the clothes, and then for a long time sat quiet, rocking gently to and fro, as one in pain, a figure of infinite woe. At last he roused himself. His mind was made up. The time for action had come. He groped his way towards the window, looking south. The doctor, who had taken off his shoes, followed him with cat-like stealthness. He easily threw open the window, for it was already partly open for ventilation. When Mr. Hilton saw him sit on the rail of the balcony and begin to raise his feet, getting ready to drop over, he rushed forward and seized him. Harold instinctively grappled with him. The habit of his Alaskan life, amidst continual danger, made in such a case action swift as thought. Mr. Hilton, with the single desire to prevent him from killing himself, threw himself backward and pulled Harold with him to the stone floor. Harold, as he held him in a grip of iron, thundered out, forgetful in his excitement of the moment, the hushed voice to which he had limited himself. "'What do you want? Who are you?' "'Hish, I'm Mr. Helton.' Harold relaxed the rigour of his grasp, but still held him firmly. "'How did you come here? I locked my door. I have been in the room a long time. I suspected something, and came to watch to prevent your rash act. Rash act? How? Why, man, if you didn't kill, you would have at least crippled yourself. How can I cripple myself when the flower bed is only a few feet below. There are other dangers for a man who, a man in your sad state, and besides, have I no duty to prevent a suicide? Here, a brilliant idea struck Harold. The man had evidently got some wrong impression, but it would serve to shield his real purpose. He would therefore encourage it. For the moment, of course, his purpose to escape unnoticed was foiled, but he would wait, and in due time seize another opportunity. In a harder and more determined tone than he had yet used, he said, I don't see what right you have to interfere. I shall kill myself if I like, not whilst you are in my care. This was spoken with a resolution equal to his own. Then Mr. Hilton went on more softly and with infinite compassion. Moreover, 
I want to have a talk with you which may alter your views. Harold interrupted, still playing the game of hiding his real purpose. I shall do as I wish, as I intend. You are injuring yourself even now by standing in the draught of that open window. Your eyes will feel it before long. Are you mad? Harold felt a prick like a pin in his neck and turned to seize his companion. He could not find him and for a few moments stumbled through the dark, raging. It seemed a long time before he remembered anything. He had a sense of time lapsed, of dreamland thoughts and visions. Then gradually recollection came back. He tried to move, but found it impossible. His arms and legs were extended wide and were tied. He could feel the cord, hurting his wrists and ankles as he moved. To him, it was awful to be thus blind and helpless, and anger began to surge up. He heard the voice of Mr. Hilton close by him, speaking in a calm, grave, sympathetic tone. "'My poor fellow, I hated to take such a step, but it was really necessary for your own safety. You are a man and a brave one. Won't you listen to me for a few minutes? When you have heard what I have to say, I shall release you. In the meantime, I apologise for the outrage, as I dare say you considered it. Harold was reasonable, and he was now blind and helpless. Moreover, there was something in the doctor's voice that carried a sense of power with it. Go on, I shall listen. He compelled himself to quietude. The doctor saw and realised that he was master of himself. There were some snips of scissors and he was free. See, all I want is calm for a short time, and you have it. May I go on? Go on, said Harold, not without respect. The doctor, after a pause, spoke. My poor fellow, I want you to understand that I wish to help you, to do all in my power to restore you, that which you seem to have lost. I can sympathise with your desire to quit life altogether, now that the best part of it, sight, seems gone. I do not pretend to judge the actions of my fellows, and if you determine to carry out your purpose, I shall not be able to prevent you forever. I shall not try to, but you certainly shall not do so till you know what I know. I had wished to wait till I could be a little more certain before I took you into confidence with regard to my guessing as to the future. But your desire to destroy yourself forces my hand. Now, let me tell you that there is a possibility of the removal of the course of your purpose. What do you mean? gasped Harold. He was afraid to think outright and to the full what the other's words seemed to imply. I mean, said the other solemnly, that there is a possibility, more than a possibility, that you may recover your sight. As he spoke, there was a little break in his voice. He, too, was somewhat unnerved at the situation. Harold lay still. The whole universe seemed to sway and then whirl around him in chaotic mass. Through it, at length, he seemed to hear the calm voice. At first I could not be sure of my surmise, for when I used the ophthalmoscope, your suffering was too recent to disclose the cause I looked for. Now I am fairly sure of it. What I have since heard from you has convinced me your having suffered from rheumatic fever and the recrudescence of the rheumatic pain after your terrible experience of the fire and that long chilling swim with so seemingly hopeless an end to it. The symptoms which I have since noticed, though they have not been as enlightening to me as they might be. Your disease 
as I have diagnosed it, is an obscure one and not common. I have not before been able to study a case. All these things give me great hopes. Thank God! Thank God! The voice from the bed was now a whisper. Thank God! Say I too! This that you suffer from is an acute form of inflammation of the optic nerve. It may, of course, end badly in permanent loss of sight, but I hope, I believe, that in your case it will not be so. You are young, and you are immensely strong, not merely muscularly, but in constitution. I can see that you have been an athlete, and no mean one either. All this will stand to you, but it will take time. It will need all your own help, all the calm restraint of your body and your mind. I am doing all that science knows. You must do the rest. He waited, giving time to the other to realise his ideas. Harold lay still for a long time before he spoke. Doctor, the voice was so strangely different that the other was more hopeful at once. He had feared opposition of conflict of some kind. He answered as cheerily as he could. Yes, I'm, I'm listening. You are a good fellow, and I am grateful to you, both for what you have done and what you have told me. I cannot say how grateful just yet. Hope unmans me at present, but I think you deserve that I should tell you the truth. The other nodded. He forgot that the speaker could not see. I was not intending to commit suicide. Such an idea didn't even enter my head. To me, suicide is the resource of a coward. I have been in too many tight places to ever fear that. Then in the name of goodness, why were you trying to get out of that window? I wanted to escape to get away. In your shirt and trousers, and they are not over much, without even slippers. A faint smile curled round the lips of the injured man. Hope was beginning to help already. Even that way. But man alive, you were going to your death. How could you expect to get away in such an outfit without being discovered? When you were missed, the whole countryside would have been up, and even before the hue and cry, the first person who saw you would have taken charge of you. I know, I know. I had thought of it all, but I was willing to chance it. I had my own reasons. He was silent a while. The doctor was silent too. Each man was thinking in his own way. Presently the doctor spoke. Look here, old chap, I don't want to pry into your secrets, but won't you let me help you? I can hold my tongue. I want to help you. You have earned that wish from any man. And woman, too, who saw the burning ship and what you did to save those on board. There is nothing I would not do for you. Nothing. I don't ask you to tell me all. Only enough for me to understand and help. I can see that you have some overpowering wish to get away, some reason that I cannot fathom, certainly without a clue. You may trust me, I assure you. If you could look into my face, my eyes, you would understand. But there, take my hand. It may tell you something. Harold took the hand placed in his and held it close. He pressed his other hand over it also, as though the effect of the two hands would bring him double knowledge. It was infinitely pathetic to see him trying to make his untrained fingers do the duty of his trained eyes. But trained or not, his hands had their instinct. Laying down gently the hand he held, he said, turning his bandaged eyes in the direction of his companion, I shall trust you. 
Are we alone? Absolutely alone? Absolutely. Have I your solemn promise that anything I say shall never go beyond yourself? I promise. I can swear. If it will make your mind more easy in the matter, what do you hold most sacred in the world? Harold had an odd thought. His question was its result. All told, I think, my profession. Perhaps it doesn't seem to you much to swear by, but it is all my world. But I have been brought up in honour, and you may trust my promise as much as anything I could swear. All right. My reason for wanting to get away was because I knew Lady Lenoir. What? Then after a pause, I should have thought that was a reason for wanting to stay. She seems not only one of the most beautiful, but the sweetest woman I have ever met. She is all that, and a thousand times more. Then why? Pardon me. I cannot tell you all, but you must take it that my need to get away is imperative. After pondering a while, Mr. Hilton said suddenly, I must ask your pardon again. Are you sure there is no mistake? Lady Lenoir is not married, has not been. She is countess of her own right. It is quite a romance she inherited from some old branch of more than three hundred years ago. Again, Harold smiled. He quite saw what the other meant. He answered gravely, I understand, but it does not alter my opinion, my purpose. It is needful, absolutely and imperatively needful, that I get away without her recognising me or knowing who I am. She does not know you now. She has not seen you yet. That is why I hope to get away in time before she could recognise me. If I stay quiet and do all you wish, will you help me? I will. And what then? When I am well, if it should be so, I shall steal away, this time clothed and disappear out of her life without her knowing. She may think it ungrateful that one whom she has treated so well should behave so badly, but that can't be helped. It is the lesser evil of the two. And I must abate you? All right, I will do it, though you must forgive me if you should ever hear that I have abused you and said bad things of you. It will have to be all in the day's work if I am not ultimately to give you away. I must take steps at once to keep her from seeing you. I shall have to invent some story, some new kind of dangerous disease, perhaps. I shall stay here and nurse you myself. Harold spoke in joyful gratitude. Oh, you are good. But can you spare the time? How long would it take? Some weeks, perhaps. He paused, as if thinking. Perhaps in a month's time I shall... I shall unbandage your eyes. You will then see, or... I understand. I shall be patient. In the morning, Mr. Hilton, in reporting to Lady Lenoir, told her that he considered it would be necessary to keep his patient very quiet, both in mind and body. In the course of the conversation, he said, Anything which might upset him must be studiously avoided. He is not an easy patient to deal with. He doesn't like people to go near him. I think, therefore, it would be well if even you do not see him. He seems to have an odd distrust of people, especially of women. It may be that he is fretful in his blindness, which is in itself so trying to a strong man. But besides, the treatment is not calculated to have a very buoyant effect. It is apt to make a man fretful to lie in the dark and know that he has to 
do so for indefinite weeks. Palacarpine and salicylate of soda and mercury do not tend towards cheerfulness, nor do blisters on the forehead add to the content of life. I quite understand, said Stephen, and I will be careful not to go near him till he is well. Please, God, it may bring him back his sight. Thank you a thousand times for your determination to stay with him. So it was that for more than two weeks, Harold was kept all alone. No one attended him but the doctor. He slept in the patient's room for the whole of the first week, and never had him out of his sight for more than a few minutes at a time. He was then able to leave him alone for longer periods and settled himself in the bedroom next to him. Every hour or two he would visit him. Occasionally he would be away for half a day, but never for more. Stephen rigidly observed the doctor's advice herself and gave strict orders that his instructions were to be obeyed. Harold himself went through a period of mental suffering. It was agony to him to think of Stephen being so near at hand and yet not be able to see her or even to hear her voice. All the pain of his loss, of her affection, seemed to crowd back on him and with it new need of escaping from her unknown. More than ever, he felt it would not do that she should ever learn his identity. Her pity for him, and possibly her woman's regard for a man's effort in time of stress, might lead through the gates of her own self-sacrifice to his restoration to his old place in her affections. Nay, it could not be his old place, for at the close of those days she had learned of his love for her. Chapter 35 A Cry The third week had nearly elapsed, and as yet no one was allowed to see the patient. For a time Stephen was inclined to be chagrined. It is not pleasant to have even the most generous and benevolent intentions thwarted, and she had set her mind on making much of this man, whom fate and his own bravery had thrown athward her life. But in these days Stephen was in some ways a changed woman. She had so much that she wished to forget, and that she would have given worlds to recall, that she could not even bear even to think of any militant or even questioning attitude. She even began to take herself to task more seriously than she had ever done with regard to social and conventional duties. When she found her house full of so many and so varied guests, it was borne in upon her that such a position as her own, with such consequent duties, called for the presence of some elder person of her own sex, and of her own class. No better proof of Stephen's intellectual process and its result could be adduced than her first act of recognition. She summoned an elderly lady to live with her and matronise her house. This lady, the widow of a distant relation, complied with all the chartered requirements of respectability, and had what to Stephen's eyes was a positive gift, that of minding her own business and not interfering in any matter whatever. Lady de Lanoir, she felt, was her own master and quite able to take care of herself. Her own presence was all that convention required, so she limited herself to this duty, with admirable results to all, herself included. After a few days, Stephen would almost forget that she was present. Mr. Hilton, 
kept bravely to his undertaking. He never gave even a hint of his hopes of the restoration of sight, and he was so assiduous in his attention that there arose no opportunity of accidental discovery of the secret. He knew that when the time did come, he would find himself in a very unpleasant situation, want of confidence and even of international deceit might be attributed to him, and he would not be able to deny nor explain. He was, however, determined to stick to his word. If he could but save his patient's sight, he would be satisfied. But to Stephen, all the mystery seemed to grow out of its first shadowy importance into something real. There was coming to her vague idea that she would do well not to manifest any concern, any anxiety, any curiosity. Instinct was at work. She was content to trust it and wait. One forenoon she received by messenger a letter which interested her much, so much that at first she was unwilling to show it to anyone, and took it to her own boudoir to read over again in privacy. She had a sort of feeling of expectancy with regard to it, such as sensitive natures feel before a thunderstorm. The letter was natural enough in itself. It was dated that morning from Varilands, a neighbouring estate, which marched with Lenoy to the south. My dear madam, will you pardon me a great liberty and allow my little girl and me to come to see you today? I shall explain when we meet. When I say that we are Americans and have come seven thousand miles for the purpose, you will, I am sure, understand that it is no common interest which has brought us and it will be the excuse for our eagerness. I should write to you more fully, but as the matter is a confidential one, I thought it would be better to speak. We shall be doubly grateful if you will have the kindness to see us alone. I write as a mother in making this appeal to your kindness. For my child, she is only a little over eight years old, has the matter so deeply in her heart that any disappointment or undue delay would, I fear, affect her health. We presume to take your kindness for granted, and will call a little before twelve o'clock. I may perhaps say, in case you should feel any hesitation as to my bona fides, that my husband purchased some years ago this estate. We were to have come here to live in the early summer, but were kept in the West by some important business of his. Believe me, yours sincerely, Alice Stonehouse. Stephen had, of course, no hesitation as to receiving the lady. Even had there been objection, the curiosity she had in common with her kind would have swept difficulties aside. She gave orders that when Mrs. Stonehouse arrived with her daughter, they were to be shown at once into the Mandarin drawing-room, that they would probably stay for lunch. She would see them alone. A little before twelve o'clock, Mrs. Stonehouse and Pearl arrived, and were shown into the room where Lady de Lanois awaited them. The high sun, streaming in from the side, shone on her beautiful hair, making it look like living gold. When the Americans came in, they were for an instant entranced by her beauty. One glance at Mrs. Stonehouse's sweet, sympathetic face was enough to establish her in Stephen's good graces forever. As for Pearl, she was like one who has unexpectedly seen a fairy or a goddess. She had been keeping guardily behind her mother, but on the instant she came out fearlessly into the open. Stephen advanced quickly and shook hands with Mrs. Stonehouse, saying heartily, 
I'm so glad you have come. I am honoured in being trusted. Thank you so much, Lady Delanois. I felt that you would not mind, especially when you know why we came. Indeed, I had no choice. Pearl insisted on it, and when Pearl is urgent, we who love her have all to give way. This is Pearl. In an instant, Stephen was on her knees by the beautiful child. The red rosebud of a mouth was raised to her kiss, and the little arms went lovingly round her neck and clung to her. As the mother looked on delighted, she thought she had never seen a more beautiful sight. The two faces, so different and yet with so much in common. The red hair and the flaxen, both tints of gold. The fine colour of each heightened to a bright flush in their eagerness. Stephen was so little used to children, and yet loved them so, that all the womanhood in her, which is possible motherhood, went out in an instant to the lovely eager child. She felt the keenest pleasure when the little thing, having rubbed her silk-gloved palms over her face, and then holding her away so that she could see her many beauties, whispered in her ear, "'How pretty you are, you darling!' whispered Stephen in reply. "'We must love each other very much, you and I.' When the two ladies had sat down, Stephen holding Pearl in her lap, Mrs. Stonehouse said, "'I suppose you have wondered, Lady Delanois, what has brought us here?' Indeed, I, I was very much interested, and I'd better tell you all from the beginning so that you may understand. She proceeded to give the details of the meeting with Mr. Robinson on the Scoriac, of how Pearl took him and insisted on making him her special friend, of the terrible incident of her being swept overboard, and of the gallant rescue. Mrs. Stonehouse was much moved as she spoke. All the fearful time of which the minutes had seemed years of agony came back to her so vividly at times that she could hardly speak. Pearl listened to all eagerness, but without fear. Stephen was greatly moved and held Pearl close to her all the time, as though protecting her. When the mother spoke of her feeling, when she saw the brave man struggling up and down the giant waves, and now and again losing sight of him in the trough of the sea, she put out one hand and held the mother's with a grasp which vibrated in sympathy, whilst the great tears welled over in her eyes and ran down her cheeks. Pearl, watching her keenly, said nothing but taking her tiny cambric handkerchief from her pocket, silently wiped the tears away, and clung all the tighter. It was her turn to protect now. Pearl's own time for tears came when her mother began to tell this new and sympathetic friend of how she became so much attached to her rescuer that when she knew he would not be coming to the West, with them, but going off to the wildest region of the far north, her health became impaired, and that it was only when Mr. Robinson promised to come back to see her within three years that she was at all comforted. And how, ever since, she has held the man in her heart and thought of him every day, sleeping as well as waking. For he was a factor in her dreams. Stephen was more than ever moved, for the child's constancy touched her as well as her grief. She strained the little thing in her strong young arms, as though the fervency of her grasp would bring belief and comfort as it did. She, in her turn, dried the other's eyes. Then Mrs. Stonehouse went on with her story. You were a Banff, 
high up in the Rockies, when we read of the burning and wrecking of the Dominion. It is, as you know, a Montreal boat of the Allen Line, so that naturally there was a full telegraphic report in all the Canadian papers. When we read of the brave man who swam ashore with the line and who was unable to reach the port but swam out across the bay, Pearl took it for granted that it must have been the man, as she always called Mr. Robinson. When by the next paper we learned that the man's name was Robinson, nothing would convince her that it was not her Mr. Robinson. My husband, I may tell you, had firmly come to the same conclusion. He had ever since the rescue of our child always looked for any news from Alaska, whither he knew Mr. Robinson had gone. He learned that up away in the very far north a new goldfield had been discovered by a man of the same name, and that a new town, Robinson City, began to grow up in the wilderness, where the condition of life from the cold was a new experience to even the most hardy gold miners. Then we began to think that the young hero who had so gallantly saved our darling was meeting some of his reward. She paused, her voice breaking. Stephen was in a glow of holy feeling, gladness, joy, gratitude, enthusiasm. She knew not which. It all seemed like a noble dream, which was coming true. Mrs. Stonehouse went on. From Californian papers of last month, we learned that Robinson of Robinson City had sailed from San Francisco, but had disappeared when the ship touched a Portland, and then the whole chain of his identity seemed complete. Nothing would satisfy Pearl but that we should come at once to England and see the man who was wounded and blind, and do what we could for him. Her father could not then come himself. He had important work on hand, which he could not leave without some preparation. But he is following us, and may be here at any time. And now we want you to help us, Lady Denlenoir. We are not sure of the identity of Mr. Robinson, but we shall know the instant we see him or hear his voice. We have learned that he is still here. Won't you let us? Do let us see him as soon as ever you can. There was a pleading tone in her voice, which alone would have moved Stephen, even had she not been wrought up already by the glowing fervour of her new friend. But she paused. She did not know what to say, how to tell them that, as yet, she herself knew nothing. She, too, in the depths of her own heart, knew, knew that it was the same Robinson. And she also knew that both identities were one with another. The beating of her heart and the wild surging of her blood told her all. She was afraid to speak lest her voice should betray her. She could not even think. She would have to be alone for that. Mrs. Stonehouse, with the wisdom and power of age, waited, suspending judgment. But Pearl was in a fever of anxiety. She could imagine nothing which could keep her away from the man. But she saw that there was some difficulty, some cause of delay. So she too added her pleading. Putting her mouth close to Lady Delamoire's ear, she whispered very faintly, very caressingly, What is your name, your own name, your very own name? Stephen, my darling. Oh, won't you let us see the man, Stephen, dear Stephen? I love him so, and I do so want to see him. It is ages till I see him. Won't you let me? I shall be so good, Stephen. 
and she strained her closer to her little arms and kissed her all over face, cheeks and forehead and eyes and mouth wooingly. Stephen returned the embrace and kisses, but remained silent a little longer. Then she found voice. I hardly know what to say. Believe me, I should, I I shall do all I can, but the fact is that I am not in authority. The doctor has taken him in charge and will not let anyone go near him. He will not even have a nurse, but watches and attends to him himself. He says it might be fatal if anything should occur to agitate him. Why, even I am not allowed to see him. Haven't you seen him? Yet? At all? Ever? Ever, Stephen? asked Pearl, all her timidity gone. Stephen smiled, a wan smile it was, as she answered. I saw him in the water, but it was too far away to distinguish, and it was only by firelight. Oh, yes, I know, said Pearl. Mother and Daddy told me how you had burned the house down to give him light. Didn't you want to see him more after that? I should. Stephen drew the impulsive child closer as she answered. Indeed, I did, dear, but I had to think of what was good for him. I went to his room the next day when he was awake, and the doctor let me come in for only a moment. Well, what did you see? Did you know him? She forgot that the other did not know him from her point of view. But the question went through Stephen's heart like a sword. What would she not have given to have known him? What would she not give to know him now? She spoke mechanically. The room was quite dark. It is necessary, the doctor says, that he be kept in the dark. I saw only a big beard, partly burned away by the fire, and a great bandage which covered his eyes. Pearl's hold relaxed. She slipped like an eel to the floor and ran over to her mother. Her new friend was all very well, but no one would do as well as mother when she was in trouble. Oh, mother, mother, my Robinson had no beard. Her mother stroked her face comfortingly as she answered, But my dear, it is more than two years since you saw him, two years and three months, for it was in June that we crossed. How the date thrilled Stephen. It verified her assumption. Mrs. Stonehouse did not notice but went on. His beard would have grown. Men wear beards up in the cold place where he was. Pearl kissed her. There was no need for words. Throwing herself again on Stephen's knees, she went on with her questioning. But did you hear him? I heard very little, darling. He was very weak. It was only the morning after the wreck, and he spoke in a whisper. Then, with an instinct of self-preservation, she added, But how could I learn anything by hearing him when he was a stranger to me? I had never even heard of Mr. Robinson. As she was speaking, she found her own ideas, the proofs of her own conviction, growing. This was surely another link in the chain of proving that all three men were but one. But in such case, Harold must know, must have tried to hide his identity. She feared, with keen eyes upon her, to pursue the thought, but her blood began to grow cold and her brain to swim. With an effort, she went on. Ever since then, I have not been allowed to go near him. Of course, I must obey orders. I am waiting as patiently as I can. But we must ask the doctor if he thinks his patient will see you. 
will let you see him, though he will not let me. This she added, with a touch of what she felt, regret rather than bitterness. There was no room for bitterness in her full heart where Harold was concerned. Will you ask the doctor now? Pearl did not let grass grow under her feet. For answer, Stephen rang the bell, and, when a servant appeared, asked, Is Mr. Hilton in the house? I think not, your ladyship. He said he was going over to Port Lanark. Shall I inquire if he left word at what time he would be back? If you please. The man returned in a few minutes, with the butler who said, Mr. Hilton said, your ladyship, that he expected to be back by one o'clock at latest. Please ask him, on his arrival, if he will kindly come here at once. Do not let us be disturbed until then. The butler bowed and withdrew. Now, said Stephen, as we have to wait till our tyrant comes, won't you tell me all that went on after the man had left you? Pearl brightened up at once. Stephen would have given anything to get away even for a while. Beliefs and hopes and fears were surging up till she felt choking. But the habit of her life, especially her life of the last two years, gave her self-control. And so she waited, trying with all her might to follow the child's prattle. After a long wait, Pearl exclaimed, Oh, I do wish that doctor would come. I want to see the man. She was so restless, marching about the room, that Stephen said, Would you like to go out on the balcony, darling? Of course, if mother will let you. It is quite safe, I assure you, Mrs. Stonehouse. It is wide and open, and is just above the flower borders, with a stone tail. You can see the road from it, by which Mr. Hilton comes from Port Lanark. He will be riding. Pearl yielded at once to the diversion. It would, at any rate, be something to do, to watch. Stephen opened the French window, and the child ran out on the balcony. When Stephen came back to her seat, Mrs. Stonehouse said quietly, I am glad she is away for a few moments. She has been overwrought, and I am always afraid for her. She is so sensitive, and, after all, she is only a baby. She is a darling, said Stephen impulsively, and she meant it. Mrs. Stonehouse smiled gratefully as she went on. I suppose you noticed what a hold on her imagination that episode of Molly Watford at the bank had. Mr. Stonehouse is, as perhaps you know, a very rich man. He has made his fortune himself, and most honourably, and we are all very proud of him, and of it. So Pearl does not think of the money for itself, but the feeling was everything. She really loves Mr. Robinson, as indeed she ought. He has done so much for us that it would be a pride and a privilege for us to show our gratitude. My husband, between ourselves, wanted to make him his partner. He tells me that, quite independent of our feeling towards him, he is just the man he wanted. And if indeed it was, he who discovered the Alaskan goldfield and organized and ruled Robinson City, it is proof that Mr. Stonehouse's judgment was sound. Now he is injured and blind, and our little Pearl loves him. If indeed he be the man we believe he is, then we must be able to do something which all his millions cannot buy. He will come to us and be as a son to us, and a brother to Pearl. We will be his eyes, and nothing but love and patience will guide his footsteps. She paused her mouth quivering. Then she went on. If it is not our Mr. Robinson, then it will be our pleasure to do 
all that is necessary for his comfort. If he is a poor man, he will never want. It will be our privilege to save so gallant a man from hardship. Here she came to stop. Stephen, too, was glad of the pause, for the emotion which the words and their remembrances evoked was choking her. Had not Harold been as her own father's son, as her own brother? She turned away, fearing lest her face should betray her. All at once, Mrs. Stonehouse started to her feet, her face suddenly white with fear, for a cry had come to their ears, a cry which even Stephen knew as pearls. The mother ran to the window. The balcony was empty. She came back into the room and ran to the door, but on the instant a voice that both women knew was heard from without. Help there, help, I say. The child has fainted. Is there no one there? And I am blind. Chapter 36 Light Harold had been in a state of increasing restlessness. The month of waiting which Dr. Hilton had laid down for him seemed to wear away with extraordinary slowness. This was increased by the lack of companionship and further by the cutting of even the little episodes usual to daily life. His patience, great as it was, naturally and trained as it had been by the years of self-repression, was beginning to give way. Often there came over him a wild desire to tear off the irksome bandages and try for himself whether the hopes held out to him were being even particularly justified. He was restrained only by the fear of perpetual blindness, which came over him in a sort of cold wave at each reaction. Time, too, added to his fear of discovery, but he could not but think that his self-sought isolation must be a challenge to the curiosity of each and all who knew of it, and with all these disturbing cases came the main one, which never lessened but always grew, that whatever might happen, Stephen would be further from him than ever. Look at the matter how he would, turn it round in whatsoever possible or impossible way, he could see no relief to this gloomy conclusion, for it is in the nature of love that it creates or enlarges its own pain. If troubles or difficulties there be from natural causes, then it will exaggerate them into nightmare proportions, but if there be none, it will create them. Love is in fact the most serious thing that comes to man. Where it exists, all else seem as phantoms, or, at best, as actualities of lesser degree. During the better part of two years his troubles had but slept, and as nothing wakes the pangs of old love better than the sound of a voice, all the old acute pain of love and the agony that followed its denial were back with him. Surely he could never, never believe that Stephen did not mean what she had said to him that morning in the beech grove. All his new resolution not to hamper her with the burden of a blind and lonely-hearted man was back to the full. In such mood had he been that morning. He was additionally disturbed because the doctor had gone early to Port Lanark, and as he was the only person with whom he could talk, he clung to him with something of the helpless feeling of a frightened child to its nurse. The day being full of sunshine, the window was open, and only the dark green blind, which crackled and rustled with every passing breeze, made the darkness of the room. Harold was dressed and lay on a sofa, placed back in the room, where the few rays of light thus entering could not reach him. His eyes and forehead were bandaged, 
as ever. For some days, as the doctor, who had his own reasons and his own purpose, had not taken them off, so the feeling of blind helplessness was doubly upon him. He knew he was blind, and he knew also that if he were not, he could not in his present condition see. All at once he started up awake. His hearing had, in the weeks of darkness, grown abnormally acute, and some trifling sound had recalled him to himself. It might have been inspiration, but he seemed to be conscious of some presence in the room. As he rose from the sofa, with the violent motion of a strong man startled into unconscious activity, he sent out a shock of fear to the eager child who had strayed into the room through the open window. Had he presented a normal appearance, she would not have been frightened. She would have recognised his identity despite the changes and have sprung to him so impulsively that she would have been in his arms before she had time to think. But now all she saw was a great beard topped with a mass of linen and lint, which obscured all the rest of the face and seemed in the gloom like a gigantic and ominous turban. In her fright she screamed out. He in return, forgetful for the moment of his intention of silence, called aloud. Who is that? Pearl, who had been instinctively backing towards the window by which she had entered, and whose thoughts in her fright had gone back to her mother, refuge in the time of danger, cried out, Mother, mother, it is him, it is the man. She would have run towards him in spite of his forbidding appearance, but the shock had been too much for her. The little knees trembled and gave way, the brain reeled, and, with a moan, she sank on the floor in a swoon. Harold knew the voice the instant she spoke. There was no need for the enlightening words. Pearl! Pearl! he cried. Come to me, darling! But as he spoke, he heard her moan and the soft thud of her little body on the thick carpet. He guessed the truth and groped his way towards where the sound had been, for he feared lest he might trample upon her in too great eagerness. Kneeling by her, he touched her little feet, and then felt his way to her face, and, as he did so, such is the double action of the mind, even in the midst of his care, the remembrance swept across his mind of how he had once knelt in just such a manner in an old church by another little senseless form. In his confusion of mind, he lost the direction of the door, and, coming to the window, pushed forward the flapping blind and went out on the balcony. He knew from the freshness of the air and the distant sounds that he was in the open. This disturbed him as he wished to find someone who could attend to the fainting child. But, as he had lost the way back to the room now, he groped along the wall of the castle with one hand whilst he held Pearl securely in the other. As he went, he called out for help. When he came opposite of the window of the Mandarin room, Mrs. Stonehouse saw him. She ran to him and caught Pearl in her arms. She was so agitated, so lost in concern for the child, that she never even thought to speak to the man whom she had come so far to seek. She wailed over the child. Pearl, Pearl, what is it, darling? It is mother. She laid the girl on the sofa and, taking the flowers out of her glass, began to sprinkle water on the child's face. Harold knew her voice and waited in patience. Presently the child sighed. The mother, relieved, thought of other things at last and looked around her. There was yet another trouble. There on the floor, where she had slipped down, lay Lady de Lamoire in a swoon. 
She called out instinctively, forgetting for the moment that the man was blind, but feeling all the old confidence which he had won in her heart. Oh, Mr. Robinson, help me. Lady Delanois has fainted too, and I do not know what to do. As she spoke, she looked up at him and remembered his blindness, but she had no time to alter her words. The instant she had spoken, Harold, who had been leaning against the window sash, and whose mind was calmer since, with his acute hearing, he too had heard Pearl's sigh, seemed to leap into the room. Where is she? Where is she? Oh God, now I am blind indeed. It gave her a pang to hear him, and to see him turn helplessly with his arms and hands outstretched, as though he would feel for her in the air. Without pause, and under an instinctive and uncontrollable impulse, he tore the bandages from his eyes. The sun was streaming in. As he met it, his eyes blinked, and a cry burst from him, a wild cry whose joy and surprise pierced even through the shut portals of the swooning woman's brain. Not for worlds would she ever after have lost the memory of that sound. Light! Light! Oh God! Oh God! I'm not blind! But he looked round him, still in a terrified wonder. Where is she? Where is she? I cannot see her. Stephen! Stephen, where are you? Mrs. Stonehouse, bewildered, appointed where Stephen's snow-white face and brilliant hair seemed in the streaming sunlight like ivory and gold. There! There! He caught her arm mechanically and, putting his eyes to her wrist, tried to look along her pointed finger. In an instant, he dropped her arm, moaning, I cannot see her. What is it that is over there? This is worse than to be blind. He covered his face with his hands and sobbed. He felt light, strong fingers on his forehead and hands, fingers whose touch he would have known, had they been laid on him, were he no longer quick. A voice whose music he had heard in his dreams for two long years said softly, I am here, Harold. I am here. Oh, do not sob like that. It breaks my heart to hear you. He took his hands from his face and held hers in them, staring intently at her as though his passionate gaze would win through every obstacle. That moment he never forgot, never could forget. He saw the room all rich in yellow. He saw Pearl, pale but glad-eyed, lying on a sofa, holding the hand of her mother, who stood beside her. He saw the great high window open, the lines of the covered stone balcony without, the stretch of the green sward, all vivid in the sunshine, and, beyond it, the blue quivering sea. He saw all but that for which his very soul longed, without to see which sight itself was valueless. But still, he looked and looked, and Stephen saw in his dark eyes, though he could not see her, that which made her own eyes fill, and the warm red glow on her face again. Then she raised her eyes again, and the gladness of her beating heart seemed to answer to his own, for, as he looked, he saw, as though emerging from a mist whose obscurity melted with each instant, what was, to him, the one face in all the world. He did not think, then, of its beauty. That would come later, and besides, no beauty of one born, of women, could outmatch the memorised beauty which had so long held his heart. But that he had so schooled himself in long months of gloomy despair, he would have taken her in his arms there and then, and, needless of the presence of others, have poured out his full heart to her. 
Mrs. Stonehouse saw and understood, so too, Pearl, who, though a child, was a woman child. Softly, they rose up to steal away. But Stephen saw them. Her own instincts, too, told her that her hour had not come. What she hoped for must come alone. So she called to her guests. Don't go, don't go, Mrs. Stonehouse. You know now that Harold and I are old friends, though neither of us knew it until this moment. We were brought up as almost as brother and sister. Pearl, isn't it lovely to see your friend, to see the man again? She was so happy that she could only express herself with dignity through the happiness of others. Pearl actually shrieked with joy as she rushed across the room and flung herself into Harold's arms as he stooped to her. He raised her as she kissed him again and again and put her little hands all over his face and stroked very, very gently his eyes and said, Oh, I'm so glad, and so glad your poor eyes are unblind again. May I call you Harold too? You darling, was all he could say as he kissed her and, holding her in one arm, went across and shook hands with Mrs. Stonehouse, who wrung his hand hard. There was a little awkwardness in the group, for none of them knew what would be best to do next. In the midst of it, there came a light knock at the door, and Mr. Hilton entered, saying, They told me you wished to see me at once. Halloa! He rushed across the room and took Harold by the shoulders, turning his face to the light. He looked in his eyes long and earnestly, the others holding their breaths. Presently he said, without relaxing his gaze, Did you see Mr. Lee at first? Yes, seeing at the periphery, but the centre being opaque? Yes. How did you know? Why, I couldn't see. See pointing to Stephen, Lady de Lanois, though her face was right in front of me. Dr. Hilton took his hands from his patient's shoulders and shook him warmly by both hands. I am glad, old fellow. It was worth waiting for, wasn't it? But I say it was a dangerous thing to take off those bandages before I permitted. However, it has done no harm. But it was lucky that I mistrusted your patience and put the time for the experiment a week later than I thought necessary. What is it? He turned from one to the other questioningly. There was a look on Harold's face that he did not quite comprehend. Hush, said the later warmingly. I'll tell you all about it some time. The awkward pause was broken by Pearl, who came to the doctor and said, I must kiss you, you know. It was you who saved the man's eyes. Stephen has told me how you watched him. The doctor was somewhat taken aback, as yet he was ignorant of Pearl's existence. However, he raised the child in his arms and kissed her, saying, Thank you, my dear. I did all I could, but he helped much himself, except at the very last. Don't you ever go and take off bandages if you should ever have the misfortune to have them on? Without the doctor's permission, Pearl nodded her head wisely and then wriggled out of his arms and came again to Harold, looking up at him protectingly and saying in an old-fashioned way, How are you feeling now? None the worse, I hope, Harold. The man lifted her up and kissed her again. When he set her down, she came over to Lady Delanois and held up her arms to be lifted. And I must kiss you again too, Stephen. If Lady Delanois hadn't loved the sweet little thing already, she would have loved her for that. The door was opened, and the butler announced, Luncheon is served, your ladyship. After a few days, Harold went over to 
very lands to stay for a while with the Stonehouses. Mr Stonehouse had arrived and both men were rejoiced to meet again. The elder, never betrayed by word or sign that he recognised the identity of the other person of the drama of whom he had told him and who had come so accidentally into his life, and the younger was grateful to him for it. Harold went almost every day to Lenoir, and sometimes the stone houses went with him. At other times, Stephen paid flying visits to the Verilands. She did not make any effort to detain Harold. She would not for worlds have made a sign which might influence him. She was full now of that diffidence which every woman has who loves. She felt that she must wait, must wait even if the waiting lasted to her grave. She felt, as every woman does, who really loves, that she had found her master, and Harold, to whom something of the same diffidence was an old story, got the idea that her reticence was part of the same feeling whose violent expression had sent him out into the wilderness, and with the thought came the idea of his duty implied in her father's dying trust. Give her time, let her choose. For him, the clock seemed to have stopped for two whole years, and he was back at the time when the guardianship of his boy life was beginning to yield to the larger and more selfish guardianship of manhood. Stephen, noticing that he did not come near her as closely as she felt he might, and not realising his true reason, for when did love ever realise the true reason of the bashfulness of love, felt in a chillness which in turn reacted on her own manner. And so these two ardent souls, who yearned for each other's love, and the full expression of it, seemed as if they might end, after all, in drifting apart. Each thought that their secret was concealed, but both secrets were already known to Mrs Stonehouse, who knew nothing, and to Mr Stonehouse, who knew everything. Even Pearl had her own ideas, as was once shown in a confidence when they were alone in Stephen's bedroom after helping her to finish her dressing, just as Stephen herself had at a similar age helped her uncle Gilbert. After some coy leading up to the subject of pretty dresses, the child, putting her little mouth to the other's ear, whispered, May I be your bridesmaid, Stephen? The woman was taken aback, but she had to speak at once, for the child's eyes were on her. Of course you will, darling, but I, I may never be married. You, you must. I know someone who will make you. Stephen's heart beat hard and rapidly. The child's talk, though sweet and dear, was more than embarrassing. With, however, the desire to play with fire, which is part of the nature of women, she answered, You have some queer ideas, little one, in that pretty knowledge box of yours. Oh, he never told me, but I know it all the same. And you know it too, Stephen. This was getting too close to be without danger, so she tried to divert the thought from herself. My darling, you may guess about other people, though I don't say you ought, but you must not guess about me. All right. Then she held up her arms to be lifted up on the other's knee and said, I want to whisper to you. Her voice and manner were so full of feeling that somehow the other was moved. She bent her head, and Pearl, taking her neck in her little palms, said, I thought, oh, long ago, that I would marry him myself. But you knew him first, and he only saved me. But you saved him. And then she laid her head down on the throbbing bosom and sobbed. And Stephen sobbed too. 
before they left the room, Stephen said to her, very gravely, for the issue might be one of great concern, Of course, Pearl, dear, our secrets are all between ourselves. Pearl crossed her two forefingers and kissed them, but she said nothing. She had sworn. Stephen went on. And, darling, you will remember, too, that one must never speak or even think, if they can help it, about anyone's marrying anyone else, till they say so themselves. What is it, dear, that you are smiling at? I know, Stephen, I mustn't take off the bandage till the doctor says so. Stephen smiled and kissed her, hand in hand. Pearl, chatting merrily, they went down to the drawing room. Chapter 37 The Golden Silence Each day that passed seemed to add to the trouble in the heart of these young people, to widen the difficulty of expressing themselves. To Stephen, who had accepted the new condition of things and whose whole nature had bloomed again under the sunshine of hope, it was less intolerable. She had set herself to wait, as had countless thousands of women before her, and as due proportion will, till the final cataclysm abolishes earthly unions. But Harold felt the growth, both positive and negative, as a new torture, and he began to feel that he would be unable to go through with it. In his heart was the constant struggle of hope, and in opposition to it the seeming realisation of every new fancy of evil. That bitter hour when the whole of creation was for him turned upside down was having its sad effect at last. Had it not been for that horrid remembrance, he would have come to believe enough in himself to put his future to the test. He would have made an opportunity at which Stephen and himself would have, with the fires of their mutual love, burned away the encircling mist. There are times when a single minute of common sense would turn sorrow into joy, and yet that minute, our own natures being the opposing forces, will be allowed to pass. Those who loved these young people were much concerned about them. Mrs Stonehouse took their trouble so much to heart that she spoke to her husband about it, seriously advising that one or other of them should make an effort to bring things in the right way for their happiness. The woman was sure of the woman's feeling. It is from men, not women, that women hide their love. By side glances and unthinking moments, women note and learn. The man knew already from his own lips of the man's passion, but his lips were sealed by his loyalty, and he said earnestly, My dear, we must not interfere. Not now. At any rate, we might cause them great trouble. I am as sure as you are that they really love each other, but they must win happiness by themselves, and through themselves alone. Otherwise it would never be to them what it ought to be, what it might be, what it will be. So these friends were silent, and the little tragedy developed. Harold's patience began to give way under the constant strain of self-suppression. Stephen tried to hide her love and fear under the mask of a glorious calm. This the other took for indifference. At last there came an hour which was full of new hopeless agony for Stephen. She heard Harold in a fragment of conversation speak to Mr Stonehouse of the need of returning to Alaska. That sounded like a word of doom. In her inmost heart, she knew that Harold loved her, and had she been free, she would have herself spoken the words which would have drawn the full truth 
to them both. But how could she do so, having the remembrance of that other episode, when, without the reality of love, she had declared herself? Oh, the shame of it, the folly, and Harold knew it all. How could he ever believe that it was real this time? By the exercise of that self-restraint which long-suffering had taught her, Stephen so managed to control herself that none of her guests realised what a blow she had received from a casual word. She bore herself gallantly till the last moment. After the old fashion of her youth, she had, from the castle steps, seen their departure. Then she took her way to her own room and locked herself in. She did not often in these days give way to tears. When she did cry, it was as a luxury and not from poignant cause. Her deep emotion was dry-eyed as of old. Now she did not cry, she sat still, her hands clasped below her knees, with set white face gazing out on the far-off sea. For hours she sat there lonely, staring fixedly all the time, though her thoughts were whirling wildly. At first she had some vague purpose, which she hoped might eventually work out into a plan. But thoughts would not come. Everywhere there was the same beginning, a wild, burning desire to let Harold understand her feeling towards him, to blot out with the conviction of trust and love those bitter moments when in the madness of her overstrung passion she had heaped such insult upon him. Everywhere the same end and impasse, she seemingly could not, would not understand. She knew now that the man had diffidences, forbearances, self-judgments and self-denials which made for the suppression in what he considered to be her interest of his own desires. This was tragedy indeed. Again and again came back the remembrance of that bitter regret of her Aunt Letitia, which no happiness and no pain of her own had ever been able to efface. To love and be helpless, to wait and wait and wait, with heart all aflame, to hope and hope till time seemed to have passed away, and all the world to stand still on your hopeless misery, to know that a word might open up heaven, and yet to have to remain mute, to keep back the glances that could enlighten, to modulate the tones that might betray, to see all you hoped for passing away. At last, she seemed to understand the true force of pride, which has in it a thousand forces of its own, positive, negative, restrainful. Oh, how blind she had been, how little she had learned from the miseries that the other woman whom she loved had suffered, how unsympathetic she had been, how self-engrossed, how callous to the sensibilities of others. And now, in her turn, had come the same suffering, the same galling of the iron fetters of pride and of convention, which is its original expression. Must it be that the very salt of youth must lose its saviour before the joys of youth could be won? What, after all, was youth if out of its own inherent power it must work its own destruction. If youth was so, why not then trust the wisdom of age, if youth could not act for its own redemption? Here the rudiment of a thought struck her and changed the current of her reason, a thought so winged with hope that she dared not even try to complete it. She thought and thought 
till the long autumn shadows fell around her. But the misty purpose had become real. After dinner, she went up alone to the mill. It was late for a visit, for the silver lady kept early hours, but she found her friend as usual in her room, whose windows swept the course of the sun. Seeing that her visitor was in a state of mental disturbance, such as she had once before exhibited, she blew out the candles and took the same seat in the eastern window as she had occupied on the night which they both so well remembered. Stephen understood both acts and was grateful afresh. The darkness would be a help to her in what she had to say, and the resumption of the old seat and attitude did away with awkwardness of new confidence. During the weeks that had passed, Stephen had kept her friend informed of the rescue and progress of the injured man. Since the discovery of Harold's identity, she had allowed her to infer her feelings towards him. Shyly, she had conveyed her hopes that all the bitter part of the past might be wiped out. To the woman who already knew of the love that had always been, but had only awakened the consciousnesses in the absence of its object, a hint was sufficient to build upon. She had noticed the gloom that had of late been creeping over the girl's happiness, and she had been much troubled by it, but she had thought it wiser to be silent. She well knew that should unhappily the time for comfort come, it must be precluded by new and more explicit confidence. So she too had been anxious waiting the progress of events. Now as she put her arms round the girl, she said softly, not in the whisper which implies doubt of some kind, but in the soft voices which conveys sympathy and trust. Tell me, dear child, and then in broken words, shyly spoken, and spoken in such a way that the silences were more eloquent than the words, the girl conveyed what was in her heart. The other listened, now and again stroking the beautiful hair. When all was said, there was a brief pause. The silver lady spoke no word, but the pressure of her delicate hand conveyed sympathy, in but a half-conscious way, in words that came so shrinkingly through the darkness that they hardly reached the ear, bent low to catch them, came Stephen's murmured thought. Oh, if he only knew! And I can't tell him, I can't, dare not, I must not. How could I dishonour him by bearing myself towards him as to that other, worthless? Oh, the happy, happy girls who have mothers! All the muscles of her body seemed to shrink and collapse, till she was like an inert mass at the silver lady's feet. But the other understood. After a long pause, when Stephen's sobbing had died away, when each muscle of her body had become rigid on its return to normal calm, the silver lady began to talk of other matters, and conversation became normal. Stephen's courage seemed somehow to be restored, and she talked brightly. Before they parted, the silver lady made a request. She said, in her natural voice, "'Couldn't thou bring that gallant man who saved so many lives, and to whom the Lord was so good in the restoration of his sight to see me? Thou knowest I have made a resolution not to go forth from the calm place whilst I may remain, but I should like to see him before he returns to that far north where he has done such wonders. He is evidently a man of kind heart. Perhaps he will not mind coming to see a lonely woman who is no longer young. There is much I should like to ask him of that land of which 
nothing was known in my own youth. Perhaps he will not mind seeing me alone. Stephen's heart beat furiously. She felt suffocating with new hope. For what could be but good from Harold's meeting with that sweet woman who had already brought so much comfort into her own life? She was abashed, and yet radiant. She seemed to tread on air as she stood beside her friend, saying farewell. She did not wish to speak, so the two women kissed and parted. It had been arranged that two days hence the Stonehouse party were to spend the day at Lemoir, coming before lunch and staying the night, as they wanted in the afternoon to return a visit at some distance to the north of Lenoir. Harold was to ride over with them. When the Verilands party arrived, Stephen told them of Sister Ruth's wish to see Harold. Pearl at once preferred a request that she also should be taken at some other time to see the Silver Lady. Harold acquiesced heartily, and it was agreed that some time in the late afternoon he should pay the visit. Stephen would bring him. Strangely enough, she felt no awkwardness, no trepidation as they rode up to the steep road to the mill. When the introduction had been effected and half an hour had been consumed in conversational small talk, Stephen, obedience to a look from the silver lady, rose. She said in the most natural way she could, Now, Sister Ruth, I will leave you two alone, if you don't mind. Harold can tell you all you want to know about Alaska, and perhaps, if you are good, he will tell you some of his adventures. Good afternoon, dear. I wish you were to be with us tonight, but I know your rule. I go for my ride. Sultan has had no exercise for five days, and, and he looked at me quite reproachfully when we met this morning. Au revoir, Harold. We shall meet at dinner. When she had gone, Harold came back from the door and stood in the window, looking east. The silver lady came and stood beside him. She did not seem to notice his face, but in the mysterious way of women, she watched him keenly. She wished to satisfy her own mind before she undertook her self-appointed task. Her eyes were turned towards the headland towards which Stephen, on her white Arab, was galloping at breakneck speed. He was too good a horseman himself, and he knew her prowess on horseback too well to have any anxiety regarding such a rider as Stephen. It was not fear, then, that made his face so white, and his eyes to have such an illimitable sadness. The silver lady made up her mind. All her instincts were to trust him. She recognised a noble nature, with which truth would be her surest force. Come, she said, sit here, friend, where another friend has often sat with me. From this you can see all the coastline, and all that thou wilt. Harold put a chair beside the one she pointed out, and when she was seated, he sat also. She began at once, with a desperate courage. I have wanted much to see thee. I have heard much of thee before thy coming. There was something in the tone of her voice which arrested his attention, and he looked keenly at her. Here, in the full light, her face looked sadly white, and he noticed that her lips trembled. He said with all kindness of his nature, for from the first moment he had seen her, he had taken to her, her purity and earnestness and sweetness appealing to some aspiration within him. You are pale. I fear you are not well. May I call your maid? Can I do anything for you? She waved her hand gently. Nay, it is nothing. It is but the result of a sleepless night and much thought. Oh, I wish I had known I could have 
put off my visit, and I could have come any other time to suit you. She smiled gently. I fear that would have availed but little. It was of thy coming that I was concerned. Seeing his look of amazement, she went on quickly, her voice becoming more steady as she lost sight of herself in her task. Be patient a little with me. I am an old woman, and until recently it has been many and many years since the calm which I sought here has been ruffled. I had come to believe that, for me, earthly troubles were no more, but there has come into my life a new concern. I have heard so much of thee, and before thy coming. The recurrence of the phrase struck him. He would have asked how such could be, but he deemed it better to wait. She went on. I have been wishful to ask thy advice, but why should not I tell thee outright that which troubles me? I am not used, at least for these many years, to dissemble. I can but trust thee in all, and lean on thy man's mercy to understand and to aid me. I shall do all in my power, believe me, said Harold, simply. Speak freely. She pointed out of the window, where Stephen's white horse seemed on the mighty sweep of green sward like a little dot. It is of her that I would speak to thee. Harold's heart began to beat hard. He felt that something was coming. The silver lady went on. Why thinkest thou that she rideth at such a speed? It is her habit. He waited. She continued. Does it not seem to thee that such reckless movement is the result of much trouble, that she seeketh forgiveness? He knew that she was speaking truly, and somehow the conviction was borne upon him that she knew his secret heart and was appealing to it. If it was about Stephen, if her disquiet was about her, then God bless her, he would be patient and grateful the Quaker's voice seemed to come through his thought, as though she had continued speaking whilst he had paused. We have all our own secrets. I have had mine, and I doubt not that thou hast had, may still have thine own. Stephen hath hers. May I speak to thee of her? I shall be proud. Oh, madam, I thank you with all my heart, for your sweet kindness to her. I cannot say what I feel, for she has always been very dear to me. In the pause before she spoke again, the beating of his own heart seemed to re-echo the quick sound of Stephen's galloping horse. He was surprised at the method of her speech when it did come, for she forgot her Quaker idiom and spoke in the phrasing of her youth. Do you love her still? With all my soul, more than ever. Then God be thanked, for it is in your power to do much good, to rescue a poor, human, grieving soul from despair. Her words conveyed joy greater than she knew. Harold did not himself know why the air seemed filled with sounds that seemed to answer every doubt of his life. He felt understood, with that understanding which is quicker than thought. The silver lady went on, now with a rush. You see, I have trusted you indeed. I have given away another woman's secret, but I do it without fear. I can see that you also are troubled, and when I look back on my own life and remember the trouble that sent me out of the world, a lonely recluse, here in this spot far from the stress of life, I rejoice that any act of mine can save such another tragedy as my own. I see that I need not go into detail. You know that I am speaking truth. I was before you came so heroically on this new scene that she told me her secret at a time when nothing was known 
of you except that you had disappeared. When she laid bare her poor bleeding heart to me, she did it in such wise that for an instant I feared that it was a murder which she had committed. Indeed, she called it so. You understand that I know all your secret, all her part in it at least, and I know that you understand what loving duty lies before you. I see it in your eyes, your brave, true eyes. Go, and the Lord be with thee. Her accustomed idiom had returned with prayer. She turned her head away, and standing up, leaned against the window. Bending over, he took her hand and said simply, God bless you, I shall come back to thank you, either tonight or tomorrow, and I hope that she will be with me. He went quickly out of the room. The woman stood for long, looking out of the window and following with tear-dimmed eyes the movement of his great black horse as he swept across country, straight as the crow flies, towards the headland, whither Stephen had gone. Stephen passed over the wide expanse without thought, certainly without memory of it. Never in her afterlife could she recall any thought that had passed through her mind from the time she left the open gate of the windmill yard till she pulled up her smoking, panting horse beside the ruin of the fisher's house. Stephen was not unhappy. She was not happy in any conscious form. She was satisfied rather than dissatisfied. She was a woman, a woman who waited the coming of a man. For a while she stood at the edge of the cliff and looked at the turmoil of the tide churning on the rocks below. Her heart went out in a great burst of thankfulness that it was her hand which had been privileged to aid in rescuing so dear a life. Then she looked around her. Ostensibly it was to survey the ruined house, but in reality to search, even then, under her lashes, the whole green expanse sloping up to the windmill for some moving figure. She saw that which made her throat swell and her ears to hear celestial music, but she would not allow herself to think of that at all events. She was all woman now, all patient and all submissive. She waited the man, and the man was coming. For a few minutes she walked round the house as though looking at it critically for some after-purpose. After the wreck, Stephen had suggested to Trinity House that there should be a lighthouse on the point and offered to bear the expense of building it. She was awaiting the answer of the brethren, and of course nothing would be done in clearing the ground for any purpose till the answer had come. She felt now that if that reply was negative, she would herself build there a pleasure house of her own. Then she went to the edge of the cliff and went down the zigzag by which the man and horse had gone to their gallant task. At the edge of the flat rock she sat and thought and through all her thoughts passed the rider who even now was thundering over the green sward on his way to her. In her fancy at first and later in her ears she could hear the sound of his sweeping gallop. It was thus that a man should come to a woman. She had no doubts now. Her quietude was a hymn of grateful praise. The sound stopped. With all her ears she listened, her heart now beginning to beat furiously. The sea before her, all the lines and furrows, with the passing tide, was dark under the shadow of the cliff and the edge of the shadow was marked with the golden hue of sunset, and then she saw suddenly a pillar of shadow beyond the line of the cliff. It rested but a moment, moved swiftly along to the edge, and then was lost in her eyes. But to another sense, 
there was greater comfort. She heard the clatter of rolling pebbles and the scramble of eager feet. Harold was hastening down the zigzag. Oh, the music of that sound! It woke all the finer instincts of the woman. All the dross and thought of self passed away. Nature, sweet and simple and true, reigned alone. Instinctively she rose and came towards him in the simple nobility of her self, surrender and her purpose, which were at one with the grandeur of nature around her, to be negative was to be false. Since he had spoken to the silver lady, Harold had swept through the air. The rush of his foaming horse over the sward had been but a slow physical progress which mocked the on-sweep of his mind. In his rapid ride, he too had been finding himself. By the reading of his own soul, he knew now that love needs a voice, that a man's love, to be welcomed to the full, should be dominant and self-believing. When the two saw each other's eyes, there was no need for words. Harold came close, opening wide his arms. Stephen flew to them. In that divine moment, when their mouths met, both knew that their souls were one.